So welcome and thank you again for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Bersha Anderson and I'm communication faculty and the current director of diversity, equity, inclusion and engagement. Uh, today we are gathered to hear the open forums for our finalists for the executive director of diversity, equity and inclusion at Paradise Valley Community College. For those joining us virtually welcome. We will invite you to submit questions via the chat during the Q&A portion of today's event. The chat is to be used solely for the purpose of submitting questions, so please refrain from any commentary or feedback. Mr. Justin Johnson will be moderating the chat. For those of us joining in person, please be sure to silence your phones. For the forums today, our finalists have been asked to address the following. In a 20 to 30 minute presentation, please explain how your background, expertise, and experiences have prepared you to be the Executive Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. What do you view as the most challenging aspect of DEI work and how do you address this challenge? After reviewing the culture commitment, what further steps would you take to address unwelcomed, offensive, or discriminatory language and or behavior at PVCC to build a culture that is diverse, safe, welcoming, and inclusive? Please provide a specific example. And then finally, considering your responses to the above prompts and research on Paradise Valley Community College, what three things would you initially focus on and why? After the final Q&A, again, for our virtual folks, please pose your questions via chat. And for those in person, you are invited to come to the microphone in the center of the room to share your question. Feedback forms can be found on the search site and the link will be posted in the chat at the end of the Q&A. After the forums are complete, the campus community, to provide feedback until Wednesday, May 4th. With that, we would like to welcome you to the public forum through the inaugural role of the Executive Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Paradise Valley Community College. This is very exciting for our college and the Maricopa Community Colleges. We are fortunate to have Dr. Amina Simmons with us today as one of our finalists for this role. Dr. Amina Simmons is the Strategic Outreach and Inclusion Lead at ASU Counseling Services, where she is also a senior staff clinician. These roles are reflective of her passion, commitment, and dedication to supporting BIPOC and other marginalized populations, both within and outside the doors of the center. Dr. Simmons obtained her PhD in Counseling Psychology from the University of Miami. Her dissertation focused on African-American women's experiences of race-based traumatic stress. She also holds a master's degree in educational and counseling psychology from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and a bachelor's degree in psychology and African studies from Pomona College. Dr. Simmons is a multi-talented, lovable, and high-energy researcher, clinician, and educator. She has experience serving demographically diverse populations in public and private colleges, universities, hospitals, community centers, clinics, and nonprofit organizations. Operating from a strengths-based model of partnership, Dr. Simmons utilizes therapeutic and participatory interventions to address both individual and historical trauma and resilience from early childhood to present, with an emphasis on racial stress and women's wellness. Dr. Simmons also thrives as a coach and a mentor in her design and implementation of the YP CONAS to ASU Campus Community Partnership with the Greater Phoenix Urban League Young Professionals. Dr. Simmons believes collaborative conversations actualize change. In all she does, Dr. Simmons is committed to building strong relationships where others feel empowered to access the map and maximize their potential to align with their values and purpose. So with that, please welcome Dr. Amina Simmons. The community forum. I am so excited to be with you today. I have a super powerful have two clickers, right? When does that ever happen? <laughs> My name is Dr. Rina Simmons. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson, for that wonderful introduction. I am the Strategic Outreach and Inclusion Lead at ASU Counseling Services, where I'm also a senior staff clinician. My preferred gender pronouns are she, her, hers. And if you have any lingering questions from our time today, or you'd like to partner with me for something more, you can find me at amina.simmons at asu.edu. So, where should I be pointing for this one? Okay, awesome. This is great. Wonderful. Thanks everybody for being patient with our technological uh, fun time. Here's our agenda for today. 
questions and emphasize fun. After that, I'll tackle four big questions provided by our university leaders. And then we'll move to what I like to call a collaborative brainstorm, what most of you are probably used to be referring to as a QA. and a um, Okay, so here's the thing. I never promise to have all the answers, period, full stop, in the sentence. And beginning of new sentence. I encourage folks to post questions because then I learn about what's important to you and I marinate on how we can partner together to pursue what's important to you. Full disclosure, I have 25 minutes today and I'm probably gonna take 28 minutes of your very valuable time, but I promise it'll be worth it. We've got a lot to cover, so let's keep moving. Introductions, here we come. So groups are great, but one-on-one -on -one conversations are really a jam, right? They allow us to build community in a different, more intentional kind of way. I'm not sure how many of you are raised in the church, but there's this old tradition of turning to your neighbor, okay? And as the meme on the slide suggests, it is troubling, however, when you don't know which neighbor to turn to. So in this case, I'm going to ask you to turn to both your neighbors and share. I know, right? <laughs> the last thing you bought in person from the store. If you're online, you can either get creative or use the chat function to DM someone you don't know on the call or maybe introduce yourself to someone who's in the room with you, as awkward as they might think it feels, I'm going to ask you to do this quickly. Sound of my voice clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice clap twice. If you can hear the sound of my voice clap three times. Awesome. Thank you so much for engaging with me and each other. This last question does two things. First, it indicates how times have changed. I had to specify in-person store, which radically changes some people's answers, right? Much of our world is dominated by digital, what sometimes seems like impersonal interactions, and that matters. The second thing can feel a little more complex. So I'm going to pose some internal reflection questions first. How many of you hesitate, didn't truthfully share the last thing you bought, or were worried one of your neighbors would judge you negatively for what you decided to share? A seemingly harmless question. And for some folks, moving through the world as they are activates their stress response. This creates concerns about how others will perceive, or in many cases, misperceive their choices. That last question was a test of how you gauge authenticity and vulnerability with strangers. That is exactly what DEI work calls us to do. Bring our authentic and vulnerable selves into relationship, usually with strangers, at least at first, in order to demonstrate our commitment to justice. Now that you're all acquainted, I want to remind you about having fun. Little Ella once asked, if you're not messy, how do you know you were having fun? So you can picture it, she was covered from fingertip to elbows in frosting. I know, right? <laughs> Can mess Absolutely. The more I walk in my purpose, the more I find Ella was commenting on perspective. Is DEI work messy? It absolutely can be. There's research findings where folks can't seem to collectively agree on the meaning. There's standards and guidelines and vocabulary. They're constantly changing, but there's also moments of joy. Moments of joy are things like the family holiday party I threw as the student parent liaison. I like to use pictures to tell stories. I think they're powerful. And with permission, I also prefer to use images of folks I really know. You'll see a lot of examples of that throughout today, and I may not fully explain every photo, but feel free to ask me about them during our questions time. This party was important, because number one, it was fun. I mean, The Poem Express is one of my favorite books, let alone holiday movies, okay? I also learned a lot in this role. The abundance of students with kiddos, so by extension, families of the university, was surprising for many administrators and leaders who I often had challenging yet enlightening conversations with. I will spare you my extensive experience navigating university and systemic red tape to host an event like this, but I will draw your attention to Harper. Harper is a perfect example of early exposure. She's not even three in a university setting wearing a baby Mizzou Tiger shirt. 
even the smallest experiences can significantly impact how our communities and individuals within our communities understand what's available and accessible to them. We had lots of fun partnering to support parenting students and the visibility of university families at Mizzou. And all of these opportunities brought together not only parenting students, but invitations to faculty and staff with kiddos through intentional relationship building. We had so much fun. We also began normalizing families' presence in higher education spaces and the need for cultivating an atmosphere where the students leading those families can thrive in pursuit of their degree. DEI work is tough, messy stuff. There's no doubt about it. It can also change lives, warm hearts, and give access to people and communities who have extensive histories of being unprotected, uncared for, and unseen. Today and every day forward, I wish you messy and tons and tons of fun. The four big questions I was asked to address by your leaders. The first, whoops. The first was to explain how my background, expertise, and experiences have prepared me for this role. So, it seems appropriate with this question to start with my professional training, some of which you see listed on the slide. But notice I said appropriate. Not that I start here because I think it's the most important. As a Black woman moving through the world and higher education, starting with this slide helps some folks believe I deserve to be up here. And you know what? Okay. One of the things I've learned in relationships, which we will talk about extensively today, is that sometimes, just sometimes, we do things that feel important to other people if and when it doesn't feel hurtful to us. So here's my professional training. And if you'd like a copy of my full CV, please feel free to email me. <laughs> it also seems fitting to share some of my primary values around DEI, the first being compassionate curiosity. I've got an extensive history counseling individuals and groups, as well as mentoring folks at various stages of their career and professional development. One pattern I notice is this rush toward solving the problem. I remind folks that problems have clear solutions. And if there's not a clear solution that emerges, then it's not a problem. It's a circumstance instead to be managed. Wait, Dr. Simmons, how did you get there? Compassionate curiosity. We don't know what we don't know. So we can always be learning. And even when we do know things, we can always be doing more, not for ourselves. Usually the more I'm referring to is about serving other people. I'll give you an example. This is a photo of me doing what I like to call a temperature check requested by a faculty member who teaches some heavy course content. When the request was directed to me, I met with a professor who with their heart on the table said, I'm worried I'm traumatizing my students. They hadn't had any specific issues. They were just acknowledging what was possible and by extension, acknowledging their own experience of stress. They asked for some help in understanding if there's more they could be doing to support their students. That is compassionate curiosity. Excuse me. We can always be learning. We can always be doing more. Compassionate curiosity is about giving ourselves and others space to wonder about things that might evoke strong thoughts or emotions, which we can all survive, by the way, and then wondering about if and what actions we're willing to take to channel those emotions into serving other people. The next value I'll highlight is my commitment to excellence. This one is actually pretty simple. I believe that you are excellent. So now we're gonna do some affirmations. I need you to repeat after me. I am excellent. Say, I am excellent. <laughs> and I will walk in that. Because that is what we deserve from each other. Thank you for participating. Commitment to excellence is about all of us. If you ask students that work with me if I'm hard on them, they'll say, yeah, she is. And then they usually follow it with, because she loves us and she knows we're excellent. I hold myself and the people around me to a really high standard of excellence, not to be confused with perfection. That is performance-based. Excellence is already within you. It's a reminder of your worth as a member of our community. You are excellent walk in that commitment. The final value I'll address today is servant leadership. Servant leadership is about shifting our status quo around what leaders can do and moving into the space of when I'm here, wherever that is, how can I serve? With my title as Dr. A, which I bring forth because representation matters for my community, sometimes folks believe that places like this are where I'm supposed to be. 
For anyone who's been, you know there are some extremely important and influential people invited to this invitation only event. I was honored to be invited by President Ashley Atkins, who you see there in the gold. She's in her second term as the president of the Greater Phoenix Urban League Young Professionals, also known as YP. If you asked me why I was there, I'd say that's where President Atkins needed me, so there I was. What many people don't get to see or expect is when I show up like this. I was also at the park to help set up for the family barbecue. Filling coolers, lugging stuff from cars, helping clean and sanitize tables. Why? Because no job is too small and no person is too big, and this is where they needed me. To this group of people, I'm also Dr. A. They've also said to me, you're not like other people we meet in higher education. You're different, like with us. Yep. So when the DJ falls through at the last minute, Dr. A, her iPhone, and Amazon Music to the rescue. That was really stressful. DJing is so hard. I don't think it's worth my strength. And when baby Holiday crawls over, this is her. That's her actual name, Holiday, right? Like, I just can't do it. When baby Holiday crawls over and her dad just wants to finish eating his hot dog, you hang out with the baby for a bit because you can, and it doesn't hurt to help. No job is too small. No person is too big. Servant leadership involves asking folks what they need, being transparent about my limitations, and showing up when I can, where I can, no matter the task. So then at this point, you've heard about some of my qualifications and experiences, including babies, grown folks, and tons of fun. But what are the challenges to this work? The second question posed by your leaders asked me to reflect on one major challenge to DEI work and how I choose to address it. My answer, we get scared and stop prioritizing growth fostering relationships. So this is just one of many hypotheses we could explore, and I find this one is generally pretty relatable. So what do I mean when I say this? Let's start with we get scared. So various researchers and clinicians collectively develop one of the theoretical frameworks I use called Time Limited Dynamic Psychotherapy, TLDP. They conceptualize this phrase, we get scared, into something called a cyclical maladaptive pattern, or CMP. You see the definition of CMP on the side, and then you see some of the characteristics, right? And what I want to draw your attention to is the results. Dysfunctional and maladaptive interactions with others. These types of interactions interrupt DEI work. So CMP is another way of saying we get scared. So then why does it matter that our fear interrupts DEI work? Well, one reason that matters is because everything is a relationship. But don't take my word for it. Relational cultural theory, or RCT, suggests people grow through and toward relationships throughout the lifespan, which is another way of saying everything is a relationship. RCT would also say, with the support of some evolutionary theory, believe it or not, that in particular for devalued communities, so this includes women, racial and ethnic minorities, and sexual minorities, just to name a few examples, for these groups, relationships are central supports helping to mitigate the impacts of stress on our individual and collective well-being. The idea of relationships being central, in particular to folks from marginalized communities, relates to the second reason why fear interrupting work matters, because everything is cultural. So Dr. Dina Bierman teaches community-based participatory research skills, and she says often, everything is cultural. RCT also suggests relational development over the lifespan is inextricably linked to individuals' racial, cultural, and social identities. Everything is cultural. And when we allow ourselves to become paralyzed by interactions that challenge cultural norms, norms that may be causing harm for some in our community, then we contribute to the development of a culture of fear. Which brings me to our third and final point for today, of course, about why fear interrupting DEI work matters. So my Miami community group's pastor used to say, people long to be known and loved. People also fear if they're known, they won't be loved. Remember when I asked you to turn to your neighbor and share? RCT suggests authenticity is necessary for real engagement and growth fostering relationships. Fear of how we'll be perceived hinders that experience. When we stop bringing our authentic selves to the table, usually out of fear, we engage with others in ways that create dysfunctional and maladaptive patterns. These patterns prevent our individual growth and contribute to diminished collective well-being. So I said to you that one challenge to DEI work is we get scared and stop prioritizing growth fostering relationships. So what's a growth fostering relationship and why is that important? So growth fostering relationships are high quality interpersonal connections characterized by empathy, mutuality, and empowerment. This means everyone involved actively participates by acknowledging power differentials and creating a relational experience where folks can challenge negative images. These are usually developed from past experiences. And the results of these efforts are the five good things that you see listed here on the slide. 
teaching people about CMPs or cyclical maladaptive patterns and growth fostering relationships is how I challenge the fear that interrupts DEI work. But let me give you an example. So I serve as the graduate advisor for Black Women Rock. BWR is not a student organization. They are, however, a group of dedicated women who decided to host an event celebrating Black women on campus and within the surrounding community. As many of you know, groups that aren't registered student orgs don't typically have funding, and money is usually what helps host a successful event. I was introduced to this group as they were planning their second BWR. They had big dreams, and they also had big doubts. They wanted and needed a champion. Wherever I'm at, how can I serve? So then in this picture, I hosted a lock-in for BWR at the Women's Center on campus, which had never been done before. Challenge cultural norms. And they were writing sponsorship letters to their community members to build their budget. The first excited phone call I got from their lead, Sarai, who you see here <laughs> dancing with joy, sharing praise reports about increased sponsorship. They were so surprised that people just kept saying yes to them. These moments are and were a big deal for this group of Black women and many others on campus. Women who didn't feel comfortable using the women's center space until I arrived there, fear. Students who had no idea one of the ways to build a budget for a program is to ask everyone. Another manifestation of fear. Growth fostering relationships are powerful. I use my position within the university, which is acknowledging power differentials, to teach them about the system they were operating within, advocate on their behalf, and be present in the lives of these young women, which are demonstrations of mutual empathy. Doing so gave them permission to take up space and ask for what they needed and wanted. After I transitioned to Miami, new job, new school, my boss at the Women's Center sent me this photo. And following another successful BWR event, the women sent me this package. These photos move my heart more than words can express. Growth fostering relationships means even after a leader moves from a space, the relationships contributing to shifting a culture for the better have the opportunity to remain. Leaders asked me to provide a specific example of an additional step I would take to address one of your PBCC culture commitments about unwelcome, offensive, or discriminatory language and behavior to help build a culture that is safe, diverse, welcoming, and inclusive. One way I preemptively strike against offense is by introducing community guidelines into any space where there's dialogue between people. And let's face it, on a college campus, that's everywhere. So this is a great strategy if we're trying to shift the culture, right? <laughs> So when I was in Toronto for a conference, I took this photo outside of one of my favorite places, the Hard Rock Cafe. Love All, Serve All is a perfect example of a community guideline. Let's take a look at some of the guidelines I use across settings and how I think this tool could be an effective way to align with and promote PVCC's culture commitment. The insert space here is intentional. The community guidelines are general enough to be implemented across various spaces, and the first four that you see here are my minimum guidelines, no matter the space. The Fight Club rule, which I'm hoping that most of you are familiar with, is added when I'm facilitating or supporting in spaces where we need to maintain a certain level of confidentiality regarding the discussion. I am one person with one perspective, right? So I invite folks in the space to contribute to this list, reinforcing our dialogue as a partnership. Being accessible is a strength of mine. And if you can't already tell, I'm relationship driven. These guidelines are worded to send a clear message about expectations while also allowing room for a little humor, which I found can help ease tension or anticipatory stress around DEI conversations. So one diva, one mic is another way of saying one person talks at a time. With groups that find this particularly challenging, I'll actually use a fake microphone. Hi, because it's fun. I mean, have you met me, right? Plus it also acts as a surrogate talking stick. If you've got the mic, you've got the floor and our attention. Speak for yourself encourages folks to use I statements. I come from a collective collectivist cultural background. The phrase I am because we are truly resonates with me. And especially when discussing DEI issues and inviting folks to engage authentically, I discourage using the collective we. So it's not to generalize, dismiss, or negate individual differences in our experiences. Furthermore, I statements. I believe. I think, I feel, challenges folks to own their voice and the way they choose to use their voice. Speaking of using one's voice, make space, take space is one of my favorites. Well, they all are my favorites. 
think to me means if you're talking a lot, just notice and consider making space for others to contribute. Take space is the flip side. We need everyone's perspective if we're going to shift the culture. Take space invites folks to engage and sometimes people need that permission. I used to call this guideline step up, step back. Then I facilitated an activity with differently able folks in the room and I realized that my language was ableist because it resonates for some folks and it's also a teachable moment. As a leader, it's important to openly demonstrate how I can adjust a theoretically good thing to ensure that I'm being as inclusive as possible. Finally, there's ouch and educate. This one is about how we will address offense and hurt feelings. If someone is hurt, upset, or offended by something another person in our group did during the dialogue, we need to address it right then as a group. So you yell ouch, we stop the dialogue, and we learn together. The person who experienced the ouch is invited to speak first and share what felt hurtful, what they need from the person, the group, the facilitator, or all of the above. The person accused of the ouch is then invited to respond, especially if what the other person needed was to understand better what they meant. The description of how this guideline is carried out seems scarier than the reality, especially when facilitators are equipped with an understanding of compassionate curiosity and distress tolerance. I'm sure you're wondering if this works, right? Or how do I know this is an effective strategy? Let me first ask you this. Can any space be 100% free from offense? Okay, right, no, the answer is no. <laughs> so that is not and cannot be the goal. We can't completely anticipate if someone will experience an ouch. So instead, we focus on what's within our scope of action by collectively establishing parameters for what respectful, inclusive interactions look like in our community. This strategy also moves us away from sitting in blame and shame, encouraging us instead to acknowledge our growth edges and use those moments to identify ways to love each other better. My language is intentional. For this to work well, it has to be shared widely and reinforced often. Returners to my Women of Color Support Circle are actually the ones who introduce our community guidelines to new members. It helps them take agency over the space. I coach faculty to use this to independently facilitate listening circles in their classrooms. I provided similar psychoeducation to my unit leaders, which benefits my colleagues when these standards are reinforced in various unit meetings. I also teach our interns and community partners how to use this strategy when they're engaging in outreach. Though it may seem surprising, I remind folks, this is not about creating safe spaces because safety is felt and no one controls our feelings. Instead of promising folks I and we cannot guarantee, we instead provide brave spaces where folks have the chance to experience safety through a collectively developed set of standards signaling a commitment to a certain type of culture, a culture of inclusion. Finally, your leaders asked me based on my previous responses to share three initial points of focus and why. Here's a roadmap of how I see my work starting. Relationship building is weaved throughout what I do. For me, it never actually stops and it is always where I start. So that's the first thing. The next two things I focus on is a needs assessment aligned with my values around compassionate curiosity and my desire to more intimately know the landscape of the institution. This does not diminish or negate the amazing work of your DEIE committee or your Take Action College team. They've done a lot of work so far, so please review their executive summary if you haven't already. Based on what you already have in place, my needs assessment accounts for what more we need to be doing. Following assessment, I'd move to expand our resources to support DEI. Let's briefly chat about needs assessment and resource expansion. Excuse me, excuse me. The Natural Resources Defense Council says, the goal of equity is to create conditions that allow all to reach their full potential. The best way to see how we're doing that well and where our gaps are is to not only conduct an initial assessment, but build assessment and evaluation throughout what we're doing. You see my typical starter questions here. And folks seem befuddled when I inquire about resources beyond dollars and cents to support DEI work. This is where I get to teach or reinforce expanding our scope and vision of what we consider an asset. People, time, skills, talent, and space are all potentially useful resources to support DEI work at PBCC. The follow-up questions are where I push teams to refine their initial answers. Intentional and thoughtful data collection increases our community's assurance that we are aligning and prioritizing inclusion and belonging, which, fun fact, 
But logging has been demonstrated to be a protective factor against the development of mental health disorders for college and university students. I'm a therapist. I had to put in a fun fact about mental health because it matters. <laughs> Initial data collection drives decision-making based on what the community is saying they have and what more they say they need. Ongoing assessment provides an opportunity to develop acute and long-term research agendas related to DEI. This strengthens our institutional commitment to enhancing the culture of PVCC and provides opportunities to partner with current faculty, staff, and students to conduct that research. My students hear me say often, nothing about you without you. That is part of my training as a community-based participatory action researcher. Inviting our community to actively engage in research about the institution communicates we value their knowledge and view them as esteemed stakeholders in promoting sustainable change. Considering participatory research as part of DEI work also allows us to expand our support resources, starting with an assessment of our individual and community assets. So serving at various public and private institutions means I've developed extensive networks of folks who are willing and committed to help, at least me. I'm sure many of you also know talented folks who'd be willing to support you, even if they're not yet fully sure about supporting the institution. Again, this is why I reinforce relationships themselves as the asset, using our relationships to guide and direct us toward other tangible resources to support DEI work at the institution. Then we use our knowledge of gaps in our resource pool to direct us toward research opportunities where we invite faculty, staff, and students to participate. So that brings us back to the community-based participatory work, which I could argue is one of the most appropriate research methodologies because of its focus on equitable partnership. So Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is one of my favorite places to search for funding. RWJF focuses on health equity, capacity building, and interdisciplinary research that supports the culture of health. If that's not DEI work, I don't know what is. An example of one of their funding opportunities is the IRL that provides up to $125,000 per team of three, which typically includes two researchers and one community partner. Opportunities like this provide students with research experience to enhance their resume, mid-career faculty with support for their research portfolios, and promotes intentional relationship building with local nonprofits like State of Black Arizona or Latinos Unidos to support PVCC's values around innovation, partnership, and excellence. Finally, there's an opportunity for us to consider private funders through philanthropic organizations or folks who have a lot of money, big hearts, and a desire to serve. But Dr. A, is that possible? Yes, absolutely. I'm Chris the Challenging Racism and Empowering Communities Through Ethnocultural Research Team during my time in Miami. Private donors, people who believe in our three CDPAR programs, right? Programs running in partnership with the Barnyard, a community center in Coconut Grove. Those private donors funded our work, funds that covered our program operations and also included graduate assistantships and funds for cultural capital experiences. Just like I taught my BWR women, one of the best ways to garner support for our work is to prioritize relationships and ask everyone. We've come to the point where I need to make space for y'all to share with me, and I hope you can collaboratively refine or identify next steps based on what I've shown you today. What questions or comments do you have for me? Um, yes, at this time we will begin the Q&A portion of the forum. So for those virtually attending, please pose your questions via chat. And for those in person, you are invited to come to the microphone in the center of the room to share your question. So. Celebration of cultural literacy for the first time ever. CDC hosted Drag Queen Story Time where a volunteer from the Drag Queen. Significant pressure from some members of the CC to cancel the drag story time of event. What would what would have you what would have been your response to this pressure? That's a great question. Um, I usually start questions like this with more questions because my question is like, who's the pressure coming from? What does that pressure look like? Are people just like mad and? Someone sent an angry email, but like, are people protesting outside of it, right? Because like our responses to certain things can look different. Um, in general, I 
really always try to understand. So like the group that feels super disgruntled about the fact that the drag queen is going to read to the babies, it's like, what are you upset about? Right. How is that any different than if we had like a character like Barney, you know, like dressed up as something different, like reading to kiddos. Right. Um, and then if the concern is what are my kids going to think? Right. How am I going to explain this to them? Oh, well, that's great. I'm hearing you say there's a need here for us to be able to provide like parents with language to talk about like queer rights and LGBTQ issues with their kiddos and their developmentally appropriate ways to do that, right? Because the reality is, is like your kids are living in this world where queer individuals exist. So why is it that we need to like shelter, you know, our PBCC community from that? We're doing our students and our, our community a disservice when we do that because we're not preparing them for the world that they're going out into. And so um, that's usually my strategy. I want to bring in the people who are upset and I want to say, talk to me about what's really going on. What's the fear here? And then I want to see if I can offer some options to support them with whatever they're afraid of without having to hinder or interrupt the event that, based on the way it was described, doesn't sound like it's inherently problematic in any way. Yeah, thank you for your support for the question. Dr. A. So my name is Callie Mari, and I work in the Office of Student Life and Leadership. Okay. First, I wanted to introduce myself. I respect your time, but I want to give you a quick compliment before I ask you a question because I'm an extrovert who's guilty of liking the sound of their own voice. And I have to say that your voice has kept me engaged from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Truly, I haven't had a break in concentration and I have to thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so going into my question, your talk about cyclical maladaptive practices made me pensive and encouraged me to check one of my own biases, which was where um, you've referenced church and your faith a few times. And sometimes as a gay person, I have this assumption that people who have a certain faith or belong to certain churches would reject me. And instead of assuming, I wanted to ask you what you say to gay people like me who sometimes like fear that rejection. Kelly, what's your name? Callie. Callie, thank you so much for correcting You're welcome. Um, I love this question because this comes up a lot when I do therapy. So I use what's called the Hayes addressing framework, right? To assess kind of cultural variables when I'm doing an intake with a student. And there are a couple of identities where I purposefully disclose because I find that otherwise you're making assumptions and it interrupts the work. And my sexual orientation is one of those identities where I disclose, and my faith is one of those identities where I disclose, right? So I wear my cross in every session and I usually say, I don't hide it. Right? Do you have any concerns about my identity as a Christian, right? Or our similar similarities or backgrounds in our faith interrupting our ability to connect? So you just like, no, as long as you're not homophobic, especially with queer babies, right? <laughs> That's what they'll say. And we're gonna get to that, right? <laughs> in, in terms of going in the order of the way addressing is spelled. So then we get to sexual orientation. They share with me, I saw on our paperwork you identify this way. Then I go, I identify as queer. Do you have any concerns about and their eyes line up? Oh no, you like, have my bow and like, wait a minute. Gets me in and I say, I've asked you all these questions. Do you have any questions for me? I'll always be honest with you if I can't answer. Students always ask me all kinds of things. And for many of my queer babies, that's one of the questions. How do you reconcile, right? Your faith and your queer identity. The first thing I say is like, listen. It takes a while and it's an everyday struggle, right? And also people can have complex identities. So and that just disturbs you and you're not really sure what to do with that, right? We can make movement. And so usually my reassurance to them is if I ever say anything, right? Same thing with Out to Educate, we do in big groups. It's the same premise, right? In a one-on-one -on -one conversation. If I ever say anything that lands on you the wrong way, I want you to tell me, I give you permission. Right. And I will also be attending to it because I understand the power dynamic. And that puts a lot of pressure on you to say, you got to be the one to call it out. So I'm going to notice too. And sometimes, Callie, I'll be working with students and I'll say something. I'll be like, ooh, you did not like that. I saw your body shift. Right? Tell me about it. Tell me how that landed on you. Right. It opens up a space for us to have dialogue. Right. And, and because I am so open about many of my identities, I find that it's helpful for many of our students because it's modeling, right? How can we have these conversations, right? Be unapologetically ourselves, but also understand that in certain spaces, we may need to move differently, right? Depending on the identities we hold and how they show up. Do you feel like I answered your question? Yes, yes, yes. And I thank you for such a thoughtful answer. Really, like, I sincerely appreciate that that was not generic. Yeah, of course. <laughs> thank you so much. We do, have a, we do have a question in yes, the chat. Oh. 
Please let us know two key results or outcomes you hope to achieve by the end of your first year as DEI director at PDCC. Wow, who came in guns blazing in the chat? After my first year, I hope that um, I have a reputation that be like, Dr. A is crazy, but she loves us so much. That's one of the outcomes I hope. Because what that means then is that I've done a great job building relationships. That people know that they can call me, whether it's one-on-one -on -one support, whether you need me to come into your classroom to do a temperature check because your students are wilding, right? You're not sure what's going on. Whether we need to come in to your unit meeting and talk about stress management because everybody is burnt out and being short with each other. Like, I want folks to know that I'm here. And I'm with you and I'm willing to be on the ground and do the work with you. Why? Because I have to train you to do it because I am going to step away. And that's important, right? A train the trainer's approach means that we can have a self-sustaining culture of DEI at PBCC. And that is always the goal, right? Sustainability. And so that would be the hope that I've done a great job building relationships that people know who I am and they feel confident in their ability to call on me, right? When they need me to serve. A second thing you know, I share this with your executive team, and even though it's seemingly small, going back to community guidelines, right? Simple idea, big impact. I would love to see that happening across different spaces. That like folk, visitors were to come to our campus and be so surprised that they walk into a meeting and it starts with a facilitator talking about community guidelines. And people are like, what is happening? We ain't never been. This we don't get unless you're in like a training, right? Or a conference, but to create it as a norm to say, no, this is just how we do meetings, right? This is just how we do class, club meetings, right? Student life meetings, right? This is just how we start, right? That for me would be ideal. Now, I don't imagine it would spread across the entire campus at the end of the year. That's asking a lot of the campus to shift that really quickly. But the hope is that we'll have, maybe it will have made some traction, let's say, for instance, in the classrooms. Let's start with our faculty members, right? And seeing if they are willing to do this in every single class, right? And see how it evolves and then get their feedback to see, okay, maybe if we start with the faculty and they're telling us what worked well and like what did not go well, right? Before we move it to implementing it with our staff or other units. Am I making sense what I'm saying? Thank you for the people that are giving me a firm again. <laughs> Thank you for the guns blazing question in the chat. <laughs> yes, sir. Accept your time. So, but I did want to preface this also with a compliment that I find your grasp of theory and your explanation of the sources and scientific under backing of your arguments in your whole presentation impressive. Mm -hmm. And I admire that. I will say that one of my, like, I understand that you preach for inclusion and challenging of cultural norms and wish to empower students to be able to not only know more about themselves, but to respect others. But I'm wondering, since college is, at the end of the day, a transitionary space to educate oneself to operate in the world, what measures you'll be able to take to try and encourage students not only to develop those here, but also to be able to go out and advocate and empower other, others in those issues in the real world? Can I ask your name? Oh, yes, I am Brad. I'm just a student here. I don't know. It's yeah, <laughs> super important, right? So, like, I'm a counseling psychologist by training. I teach our intern diversity seminar. So, these are, they're on their verge, our verge of like medical residency, right? Like, before they like move out to the world, they're career professionals. And I tell them all the time, it is insufficient alone for you to be doing therapy. Sometimes they look at me like, what do you mean? What else am I supposed to be doing? Right? And it's like you serve in your community, especially those that are counseling psychologists. It is a value of our field as counseling psychologists that we are committed and dedicated to serving our community. So if you are not engaged in civic engagement, then what are you doing? Right? And the crazy thing is, DEI strategies implemented in higher education, if you look at the research on engagement, what it does is it significantly increases students' political participation, their civic engagement, and their multicultural activism. So, like, there's already a platform for why we should be doing this, because then it'll just emerge kind of organically, right? Um, I think that opportunities for students to engage civically are important. 
they're actually, when I say easy to do, it's a matter of let's work smarter, not harder. There are community organizations and nonprofits who are constantly hosting events where they need volunteers. Why are we not publicizing those more to our students and our faculty and staff? Because here's the other thing. The research says if y'all aren't modeling for them what they're supposed to be doing, then they don't understand why it's important. And if we're trying to shift the entire culture, which y'all are also a part of, then that means, you know, I'm not looking at y'all. I know I'm saying y'all too, like I'm from the South, because I am, right? <laughs> from North Carolina. But that's important to understand that this is actually all of our responsibility. So if we're not modeling this type of engagement for our students, then then how are they going to know it's valuable? So like, yes, students will see me at the Founders Day dinner because there are people taking photos and all kinds of things there, but it's also important that they see me at the park, right? And that they see me doing the stuff that they wouldn't expect to see me doing because, oh, Dr. A has a gold badge, but like, yeah, but like sometimes you got to put the three sons in the cooler, right? Because like that's what needs to be happening in that moment. And so I think really providing opportunities to partner. And then part of my ignorance here, does PBCC already offer service learning? It's under, okay, okay. So the research also demonstrates that service learning, if it's specifically curated to include different things, it also increases, you know, students' engagement, right? And their critical thinking skills. It's a, it's a DEI strategy is what service learning is. I ran our language partners program at when I was at Mizzou, which is where we pair native English speakers with non-native English speakers in a one-to-one -one kind of relationship. And they're like, what do we do with our language partner? Talk to them, go upstairs at the, at the on the floor of the studio where they have all the restaurants and stuff and talk about like how we order things from restaurants and navigating the bookstore. And I had a student worker at the time who was, this was like her jam. She's like, I really want to like host an event. Like, do activities, but I'm scared the bosses will say no. I said, I'll ask for you. Together and we would host events. And you're talking about it's enough when you have like a group of folks from the same like region who don't speak English with not with native English speakers in the room. But imagine taking groups of folks from different regions who speak different languages, plus our native English speakers, putting them all in one room, trying to host an event. It was hilarious. And also, we had so much. What was great about it was it was also service learning, right? So I was wrangling like 300 students at a time for credit. And then I'm meeting with them and we're having accountability checks. What are you doing? What are you learning? How is this helping you? The cool thing is what we found is that some students started doing it because like, oh, my teacher said I had to have service learning and they could just choose any service learning activity as long as they were doing it. But they would come back to language partners because their relationship was so valuable or people would maintain relationships with their language partner. So then when their language partner returned to their uh, native country, right, then they would be like, I'm going to go get to the relationships that can be built through that and that that's a strategy right how we build our students intercultural fluency and effectiveness and teach them how to kind of navigate our globalizing world so thank you so much again so if you all could join me one more time in thanking dr sunan Forms can be found on the search site, and the link will be posted in the chat for those attending virtually. After the forum is complete, use and feedback forms with the campus community to provide feedback until May 4th. Uh, thank you again for your time, and we will now take a 10 minute break.